Hello, I'm Antonio D'Amico, this is Pointy Hat, and welcome to... Got you. Not D&D with a twist. This is how you capture an audience, you see. Unexpected developments, turns, twists. Well, I, I guess not twists, although technically... Anyway, if you're new, I do this little dog and pony show called D&D with a twist here. But I felt like switching it up today. Welcome to... Witch Lich. Who's that Pokemon? It's... Asararak, the Eternal Tormentor. If you take a goose or a gander at my channel, you'll see that not long ago I made a video on giving liches a twist. In it, I talked at length about how much I dislike the fact that other spellcasters get shoved into the lich box when we need them to be an undead spellcaster, and how cool it would be to make unique undead monsters for each class. And then I made one for the bard. It's called an intoner. It stays alive as long as people remember their best song. That's what that video is about. If you haven't seen it, Go take a look! Anyway, while writing it, I got really excited about the idea of turning it into a little series, and then people were surprisingly very, very into the idea. It's today the concept I've made that has garnered the most praise from y'all, so thank you! Thank you for being so kind! So in light of that, and how many ideas I had about giving other classes the same treatment, that's how Witch Lich was born. That's what you're currently watching. You, you're currently watching that. You're welcome! Or thank you for watching, I guess. So, you've read the title, we're doing Sorcerer Liches. Before getting into it, we should define what a sorcerer actually is. My D&D with a twist sorcerer video will contain the full breakdown on these guys, but for now, here's a quick rundown. Sorcerers are charisma casters that derive their magic from themselves. Basically, the main difference between sorcerers and all other casters is that a sorcerer's magic is innate. It's within them. All other spell casters choose to become what they are. A wizard chooses to learn their spells, a cleric worships a god and gains divine magic through their devotion, a warlock makes a deal with a mystical sugar daddy in exchange for their power, but sorcerers Sorcery, it's something that happens to you. You don't choose to become a sorcerer. You are one or you aren't. Most of the time, this translates into sorcery being in your very blood. Yep, sorcerers are D&D's Nepo babies. Something happened to someone one time to turn them extra magical, and now all or some of their descendants have that same extra magic innately in their blood. Your great-great-grandma made some very creative choices in her dating life? Congrats! You and your whole family are draconic sorcerers. You can guess what happened. Sorcerer's powers don't necessarily have to come from your bloodline. It's more rare, but you could be the very first of a long line of sorcerers if you make your own creative choices. Be the frisky grandma you want to see in the world. That eldritch abomination is giving you bedroom eyes from across the bar? Congrats. You and your descendants are now aberrant mind sorcerers. Hopelessly drawn to the inherent eroticism of the sea? Bam! You and your little crush dumplings are now powerful sea sorcerers. Wanna f a clock? Clockwork soul. You get it, and go get it. I want that clock to f me. So that's basically sorcerers, people that don't choose their magical powers, but rather have received their powers by their ancestors through their bloodline. Their magic is inherently tied to their family line, their bloodline. That's interesting to me. We should do something with that. Cool, we have the baseline idea of a sorcerer down, so how do we make a lich for them? We gotta define what makes a lich, well, a lich. I talked about this a ton in my lich video where I made the bard lich go watch that and then come back to this. So I'm not gonna go into the lich basics. I'm gonna concentrate on what the ingredients are to make a lich feel lichy. First off, it needs to be someone that has deliberately chosen to become undead to achieve immortality. I feel like that's the essence that makes a lich a compelling character. Yes, I'm sure you can come up with a reason for someone being forced to become a lich or whatever. I'm also sure that's somewhere in a book I haven't read. Sorry guys, I'll do better at being born earlier in my next reincarnation. But in order for a creature to feel like a lich, it needs to have chosen undeath specifically to never die. Another important part of the lich cocktail is ritual. The lich must go to great lengths to achieve lichdom, or else any rando of the street could become a lich. You must achieve a certain level of mastery in your particular choice of abracadabra Oogly Boogly School of Magic. This is important because right after you create any new lich, the immediate question is always going to be, how do I make a character that becomes that? So making it so that it's something that is hard but achievable means your edgy players can work towards it until the campaign fizzles out because of schedule- uh, I mean, I mean, uh, until they accomplish their goals. Definitely. We all get to level 20. Sure. Related to ritual, a big part of liches is their use of a phylactery. Something, or someone in my case, that is keeping them alive. The soul is stored in the phylactery. The reason why this is important is because it gives liches a weak spot, a fail state. Something that when destroyed kills the lich instantly, which allows you to make the lich itself ungodly powerful and have the players aim to destroy the phylactery itself rather than the lich. 
You can throw a lich at a level 10 party if there is a way for them to destroy the lich by taking down their phylactery. While the lich remains this unstoppable force that the party can't even hope to beat in a one-on-one -on -one combat. Sort of like Strahd for most of the course of Strahd campaign. It also allows you to write a completely different adventure for liches. What if the party kills the lich midway through it and the rest of the adventure is ensuring that the lich doesn't rise again by destroying its phylactery before the lich can come back? That's a cool adventure with a very natural ticking clock to keep the tension up. Lastly, and I know this is controversial because it was introduced in 5e and we hate things that are new and love things that are old, but I do really, really like the idea that a lich's condition is not eternal unless they actively work to preserve it. Before you come for my non-existent throne, let me explain. Yes, I understand that most traditional liches become liches to spend more time nerding out in their wizard towers, but I think that making them work for their undeath unlocks many, many dramatic possibilities that are just way too tantalizing for you to leave on the table. First, it makes them more active. If all a lich does is sit around and read books or whatever, that makes for a pretty static figure that is actually kind of hard to fit into an evolving narrative. If the lich has to go out every, I don't know, decade or so to ensure that they stay undead, that means that there's ample opportunity for the party to bump into the lich, or for the party to learn about what the lich needs to do to stay immortal and try to stop them. Or hell, maybe even help them accomplish that. See how that's a much easier thing to build a story around than just a guy that sits inside all day covering their books in Cheeto dust and Mountain Dew stains? But that's not the biggest gripe I have with a lich that just has lich them as sure for eternity. What I find most compelling about making the Lich have to actively work on their undeath is this. It pushes them to the limit. Yes, a person might have gone into Lichdom with pure intentions. Maybe they turned themselves into a Lich to protect something or someone they love for hundreds of years, and their fear of death being pushed away for a couple of centuries was such a nice bonus to that. But as the strength leaves them, as mortality comes back knocking at their door now that the threat that endangered what they set out to defend is gone, what do they do? Do they keep inflicting pain and suffering onto others selfishly just to not die? They could become this massively powerful arcane being that at the same time is terrified of dying. That's compelling. That's super compelling. I love that. So yeah, all the liches I make through this series will have to in some way ensure that they stay undead. And not just dead. Or not just un. Sorry if you hate this, but you can make your own. You have a home, ostensibly. Or at least I hope you do. Brew something in it. Make your own homebrew with blackjack and liches. So to recap, in order to feel like a lich is a lich, it must. 1. Choose undead to achieve immortality. 2. Go through a complicated ritual to become a lich. 3. Have a phylactery that acts as the lich's weak spot. And finally, 4. The lich must actively work on preserving their state of undeath. Cool. That sounds like a recipe to make a lich to me. So let's get to it. We've gone through what a sorcerer is, we've gone through what we need to make a lich. How about we make a sorcerer lich? So if sorcerers are magic nepotism babies and liches are arcane undead beings extremely committed to anti-aging products, how do we mix the two? Well, I propose that we concentrate on the most important aspect of what makes a sorcerer different from any other class, magic through bloodline. If a sorcerer gets their magic from their heritage, the literal blood passed down to them through generations, a sorcerer lich should have their lichdom tied to that as well. Let me present to you the Hierarch. When we think of immortality, many of us think of achieving it through our legacy. Continuing the family line, becoming parents and raising a new generation so that part of us may live on in them. Hierarchs take that to its extreme conclusion. If their bloodline remains strong, if it passes down from one generation to the next uninterrupted, what lives on is not just their legacy, but themselves. A sorcerer that wishes to become a Hierarch has perhaps one of the harshest journeys to achieve lichdom in front of them. A hopeful Hierarch will have to go through a particularly complicated and painful ritual with one goal in mind. Bind their soul to their blood. Hierarchs turn the blood running through their veins into their own phylactery. The specifics of this ritual differ by blood type and sorcerer's magic. It's not uncommon for a Hierarch to be to go through it several times, expecting to die during their failed attempts and requesting the help of a cleric to be brought back to life so that the sorcerer can try again. The process is arduous, but the fruits are worth it. Once completed, the Hierarch's blood and soul become one, and then the true work begins. The Hierarch will then ensure that their blood is passed down onto their descendants. Their children and those children's children in turn will all be living phylacteries to their Hierarch. As long as they live, the Hierarch won't die. Those descendants will enjoy the sorcerer's powers of the Hierarch, becoming incredibly powerful spellcasters in their own right. But the Hierarch in turn will gain power over them. 
The Hierarch has given their bloodline a poison gift. Anyone with the Hierarch's cursed blood running through their veins is not only the Hierarch's phylactery, but also their puppet. The descendants might be incredibly powerful, but they must all answer to their Hierarch's will, whether they want to or not. This allows the Hierarch to have the power of their entire sorcerer's family protecting them. The more descendants that they are, the more phylacteries of the Hierarch exist, and the more people are out there to defend and enact the Hierarch's will. But there's always a catch. With each generation, the Hierarch's blood becomes thinner. The more generations are removed from the Hierarch, the less control the Hierarch has over them, and the less blood they share together. After enough generations, the Hierarch loses the strength to retain their physical form, turning into the Hierarch's version of a demi-lich, what's called a figurehead. And then, once the last of the Hierarch's descendants that still has their blood coursing through their veins dies, so does the Hierarch. But Hierarchs have fought too hard for immortality to let this stop them. When they feel their powers waning with the passing generations, they start to work on a different, even darker ritual. They will select one of their descendants, a particularly powerful one, one with access to great amounts of sorcerer's magic. Hierarchs call this descendant their heir, and will pamper them and train them to ensure that their magical abilities grow as strong as it is possible, almost rivaling those of the Hierarch. Once the heir is sufficiently strong, the ritual may commence. The Hierarch will shed their body and possess the body of the heir, using the blood phylactery that runs through the heir's veins as an anchor for their soul. Once the process is complete, the Hierarch's journey begins again as they have gained a new body. They'll strengthen their bloodline again, ensure that it passes down the generations, preserving their immortality and gaining the support of a powerful magic lineage that can do nothing but obey their every word. When going against the Hierarch, you go against them and their entire bloodline. Okay, you gotta admit, that's pretty cool. Sick me now. It hits all the points we outlined about how to make a lich feel like a lich. Lichdom doesn't happen to them, they choose it. They have to go through a whole complicated and dangerous ritual to turn into liches. They certainly have their phylactery, which is their literal blood that they pass down to their descendants, turning them into phylacteries too. And they absolutely gotta work to stay immortal by preserving their bloodline and eventually raising an heir so that the hierarch can take over their heir's body. All while feeling very sorcerous with the whole emphasis on bloodline and magic pass down through the family. I would say we've hit the mark. I think the Hierarch is a really, really neat creature that can very much carry a whole arc on their own. Or hell, its own campaign. But talk is cheap. Let's see how we can make some adventures based on the Hierarch. For the first one, let's go with a classic Hierarch story. I don't know if we can call it a classic. I just, just made the monster, but you know, the baseline. This insanely influential family has held power in their country for as long as anyone can remember. Their members have wriggled their way to basically every facet of life there. They control the government, major businesses, production, everything is in their hands. The most powerful members are the closest to the head of the family, one called the Undying Lord. The family says that the reason why their patriarch literally can't die is because he's been chosen by the gods to lead the country. But the true reason is that he's an ages old hierarch that has gone through like 10 heirs already. The party must then make their way through the country, taking out the most powerful members of the family that serve as phylacteries to the Hierarch, until they are able to face the Hierarch himself. You could have them be different sorcerer's origins, as the Undying Lord has decided to marry his progeny to other powerful magical families to create powerful heirs and phylacteries. Imagine the fights, all the villains you can make with that. I think that sounds cool, I, I will play it. But what if we took it in a completely different direction? What if we went for a more PC route? I bet for some of you this idea popped into your head the moment I mentioned heirs. Olaya was born to an extremely old and powerful sorcerer's family. And from the moment she was born, it was clear to everyone how strong her sorcerer's powers were. Olaya became extremely close to her grandmother, despite never being able to see her. Olaya's grandma suffered from very poor health and could not be exposed to other people at all. They only spoke through a screen, but her grandma believed that Olaya's abilities could be cultivated and grown to turn her into an even more powerful magic user. The matriarch oversaw Olaya's training and the two formed a very strong bond. Under her grandmother's tutelage, Olaya grew into an extremely powerful sorceress, until one night, she was awoken by the members of her family, who told her that grandma was deathly ill, and that now was the time to finally say goodbye. With tears in her eyes, Olaya entered her grandmother's room, ready to finally see her and say her final goodbye. But what awaited behind the screen was less than a corpse, but it wasn't dead. Olaya's grandmother is not her grandmother at all, but a centuries-old hierarch at the end of her own life. 
and Olaya had been selected since birth to become her grandmother's new heir, her new body. Olaya narrowly fled her childhood home that night, but now she's being haunted by her own family, and though her grandmother's influence is not as strong in her as it is in her other family members, she feels how her grandma's grip on her is pushing her to get caught. For how long can Olaya run away? That's a sick PC backstory if I've ever heard one. Give her high charisma, a decent intelligence for all that studying, an okay dex because you know that noble's all fencing, and an insane dose of trust issues after learning that her entire childhood was a lie to turn her into basically a sacrificial lamb. As for a subclass, you can basically pick any sorcerer's origin, although it's such a shame that there's no undead themed sorcerer subclass to go with liches. If only someone made one of those one day. Hmm. But anyway, imagine the drama, fighting the family that raised you as a golden child. What if some love Olaya, but are forced by the hierarch to capture her? Can Olaya's grandma be convinced to let her go, or do they need to fight? I don't know, you do if you decide to play her and make your character based on this. And I can think of several other ways to include hierarchs in your games. What about an extremely naive guy that is not aware that he is the latest descendant of a once powerful sorcerer's family that came to ruin under their hierarch? He's not very bright, but he found this cool talking skull that has helped him in his journey so far. Except this talking skull is the figurehead of his great, 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 great grandpa, and he's trying to make our boy stronger so that he may one day take over his body and live again. That's cool. I think there's plenty to do here. It's just a shame that you'll have to come up with all of this. You know, like stat blocks and you know, it has to be a powerful monster. So gotta add lair actions, legendary actions, all that. Sounds like a lot, really. But guess what? You don't have to because I did it. That's right. The Hierarch is for you to use in your own games. And it's in the description of this very video for absolutely 100% certified free. I wrote it, I designed it, and I illustrated it, and now you can take it. So go out there, get those DNA testing ancestry website things, and find a way to kill your great, 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 great grandpappy. And welcome to the end of the video. New series! I hope you like this one. I am kind of like trepidatious because it's so specific on a specific monster, but I just felt like doing it. I hope that this goes on. I guess it depends on like the reception. So if you like it, uh, be nice of you to share this around. It, it, please do if you like the series because that's what's going to determine if I keep doing it. Basically, I, I am here to please. I aim only to please. Thank you so much for watching everything. Uh, I'm super excited to keep going. I really want to keep adding new series to the mix and try new things. Uh, by the way, new content is coming. Very different content from what I normally do, but not so different. You will see. You will see. I'll, I'll, I'll write, keep my secrets. I'll keep my secrets, but you'll see very soon. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you for watching and sharing. The channel is still very new, but at this point, it feels weird to say it because it has grown so much. Okay, I'm going to go now. Be respectful of your elders, except not really. I don't believe that. No. 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 Just be respectful of people that are respectful to you. Okay. What a weird way to end the video. Okay. Bye. Love you. Mwah.